Hello, everyone, and welcome to All Things Relative, Finding Your Family at the Library. I'm very happy to have you all here and very excited for this, this month's topic. Um, Kathy Nielsen will be our, she'll be the host. She'll be tell, teaching us all about how to trace our family history. Uh, just a couple um, rules for the Zoom. Um, I ask that if everyone could please mute yourself um, while Kathy's talking just to help limit distractions. If you do have a question that comes up, please feel free to place it in the chat um, and I will read them out loud um, at the very end. Or if you have questions, please feel free to chime in. We're gonna have some question and answer time at the very end. And then after that, let's enjoy. And Kathy, it's all yours. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, see if I've... Okay, do you see my screen, Sean? Yes, looks, oh, looks okay. great. Okay, so every home has a story. And those of you that have been with me for some of our prior All Things Relative know that I love to tell stories. In my past life, I was a, a children's librarian, so stories are really important to me. And that's what makes family history so interesting. And homes, not only the people that lived in the homes, but homes have a story as well. And that's what we're going to touch on today. You may have read a couple of weeks ago in the Chronicle, my brother sent me a clipping of this, which was um, a story of a family. They live out in the Sunset or Richmond District of San Francisco. They were uh, retrofitting their, their home uh, seismically, and a diary fell out of the ceiling. It was a hundred year old diary. Now, not all of us are that lucky to have a diary fall out and then be able to put together the history of a house, but we can put together the history of our homes and those of our ancestors using other tools. This is a picture of my great grandparents' home in Prunedale. It's off Highway 101, and this home was in my family for 90 years. And I'm gonna share a little bit about how I put together the story of this home and the family that lived in that home. So probably like me, you've wondered about who lived in the house that you live in before you and what was their life like if only the walls had ears and could share with us the things that those, that house, uh, the things that happened in that house. Every home where your ancestors lived has a story. And every home where you lived has a story. And this is where you and your family have lived and loved and laughed and cried. And maybe even some of your ancestors have died in these homes. These homes have left their mark on your family and on you. And in turn, you've left your mark on that house or your family's left your mark on that house. There's really something about standing in the home or on the land of, of where your ancestors lived. And many of you probably have had that opportunity, but it is, uh, for me, it is just such a thrill to think, yes, a hundred years ago, my great grandparents lived in this house and lived on this land. So today I'm gonna to do two case studies and, and I'm going to do it in the form of a story because I am a storyteller. Um, but I hope that you will, as I tell the stories, you'll pick up ideas about how you too can put the story of your house together. The first case study is about my own home and how I researched that house and found out about the people who lived in my house, which is only about 70, 60, 65 years old. But nevertheless, there was a story, there is a story connected to my house. And the second is to research the family of your ancestors. And I'm gonna do that by sharing with you the home of my great grandparents in Primdale. So let's get started. So the questions you wanna ask yourself is, Say you have a picture of a house and you're trying to figure out who lived in that house and you want to know more about that house. Well, if you can figure out about the time that house was built, that will help you. And you can do that by figuring out the architectural style of the house, because that will date the house, at least within terms of a couple of decades. 
And if you know who the architect or the builder is, that's even better because then you can research them. You know, in genealogy, family history, we go down all kinds of rabbit holes. We're researching one thing and then we see something else. And then uh, when I found out the architect of our house, of course I had to research him. Um, but that's all part of the story, these, these tangents that we get on. You might wanna know who the original owner of your home was. Who else owned it and lived in that house after the original owner? And you might be interested in how the house has changed over the years. That, that interested me. And I wanted to explain some of the odd rooms in our house. And being an historian, one of the things that really intrigues me is how a house fits into the history of the area and of the time. So as you're doing your research and you're figuring out about your house, much of the story is the historical context of your house, not necessarily the specific house. And we'll, I'll share, share with you what I mean by that. So one of my go-to books, this is available at the Monterey Public Library, is A Field Guide to American Houses by Virginia Savage McAllister. And what she does is identify the different kinds of architecture in America. And by using this book, you can place the picture or the photo of the house that you have and say, okay, that may be in those 20 year period and it is a folk house, it is a Victorian house. Colonial houses, of course, are in the 1600s and they were still being built into the 1800s. Some of you may have sod prairie houses. I know that um, my great grandparents very likely were in a sod prairie house. Um, my Swedish great grandparents, I'm gonna talk about the English side today. Um, the folk houses were very common in the Midwest and on, on the West Coast and on the East. These were the farmhouses, 1850 to 1930, and you probably have one of these in your family. And Victorian houses, 1860 and on. The craftsman houses, some of us have these bungalows in our family. These are uh, the Julia Morgan, the um, Maybeck houses. 1905 to 1930, very popular in Berkeley. Uh, also, you see them in, uh, in Oakland, you see them down in Southern California. The Spanish Revival Houses, we have these in Monterey. You may be living in a Spanish Revival House and that would be capturing the essence of the Spanish um, um, land grant homes, 1915 to 1940. The Monterey houses, we have the real Monterey houses in Monterey, but that became very popular copies of that in the 1924s, 1955. The minimal traditional, you probably have those in your family. Those are the houses built after the depression. They're the two bedroom, one bath house that were very economical in that time. And they're still around and still lived in and still loved. Some of you may have been raised in the 1950s. And later on in the 50s, we have the mid-century organic house, 1950s. That's, that's what the style of my house is. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Nothing as wonderful as this, as this picture or as um, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright house, but it has some of those elements. So I live in Carmel Valley. I live in the area where we have vineyards and horses and some cattle. And up until the 1950s, it was really the country. But in 1950s, things started to take off. One of the things I like to do when I'm researching a home or researching a family is I like to put together a timeline. And I really recommend that you do this as you try and figure out if using different sources, the story of your family through a timeline. So because I'm looking at the whole area of Carmel Valley and the area where my home was built in the 1950s, I wanna think back to, to several hundred years, thousands of years, when the Esalen tribe came into Carmel Valley, they were gatherers and fishermen. They settled along the river, the Carmel River. Um, they were in the upper Carmel Valley. They were surrounded by the beautiful Santa Lucia mountains. And even today, you can see the grand, grounding rocks in Garland Regional Park, come up if you're on the, the trail up to the Mesa. Um, so I think of, of the Esalen tribe being on the land where I, where I live today. And um, I, I find that to be um, very special. In the 1840s, the Rancho Los Lorelos was established. Now that we've got the Mexican land grants and the ranchos all over California. We've got quite a few in this area, but the Rancho Los Lorelos was in 1840 and that is the Carmel Valley area. 
And then I wanted to look at what was happening in the 1950s and why the why it changed so drastically. And I and I want to go into that a little bit. Um, I live in the Rancho Del Monte subdivision. So what was happening was this Rancho Las Lorelas through sales was divided into different divisions. And the house that I live in was built in 1956. It was built by James and Margaret Ziegler. They had five to six acres. The architect was Walter Bird, and the house was one of only three houses built on a half mile road off Carmel Valley. So it was one of the first houses built on, on in this area. In 1986, James D. Ziegler sells the house to Larry D. and the lot is divided and there's some additions and some changes. In 1988, a survey is taken of the land. And in 1991, the house is sold to Paul P. and the lot is divided into three parcels. The six acre lot is divided into three parcels. And in 1994, my husband and I and our family bought the house and moved to the house. So how do I get all this information? Well, I wanna share that with you today. I wanna to go back a little bit more because the historical context I think is so important. The Baranda family are the ones who owned the Rancho Las Lorelas and the Baranda house, ranch house is still in existence out here in Carmel Valley on Baranda Road. This is, these are members of the Baranda family. There's also a Baranda house at the uh, Monterey Historical Society. Maybe some of you visited that. And you might want to go and visit that because it is a chance to see how a family would have lived during that time. Um, Jose Manuel Baranda was a son of Manuel Baranda, and he accompanied Father Sarah on the second California expedition. And Baranda and his wife, Juan Akota, had 15 children. Um, and she's the one who's said to have developed Monterey Jack cheese. There's some question about that because Jax, who was a land developer, would like to claim credit for it. But it's believed that she probably was the one that did it. So the Veranda Adobe is still in existence. It's owned privately, and occasionally there's a function there. Um, but it's, it's really wonderful to have it in the neighborhood. So I like to think of myself as being a neighbor of the Verandas. The Ranch of Los Lorelas extended from Carmel Valley Village to Garland Ranch. And it went from the top of the Laurelis grave to Snively's Ridge. So it was about 6,000 acres. And my home is in that, that part of the area. And the name came from a large bay laurel that grew near the, near the present Las Laurelis Lodge. Some of you may know that that is right there by the Laurelis grave. And they raised cattle and horses. So I imagine cattle and horses were all over the hills um, where my home is. And then Nathan Spaulding came along. He was a mayor in Oakland. And he brought in more modern farming techniques. He started to develop the area. He brought in a water line. He planted eucalyptus trees that line Baranda Road. Um, that is the road that goes to the Baranda, where the Baranda home is. And he built some of the ranch houses and buildings that are now part of the Las Lorelas Lodge. So when he was there for about seven years and he did his magic. And then the Pacific Improvement Company, and that's the big four. Crocker, Huntington, Hopkins, and Stanford came in and bought Lorellis, uh, Las Lorella, the area. They purchased the rancho and they hired William Hatton, who was a dairyman at the mouth of the valley. Uh, the barnyard is actually where his dairy was located, the barnyard shopping area. And they uh, wanted him to supply dairy products to the Hotel Del Monte, which they were also developing. So William Hatton came out and ran the dairy out here. And in the process, the milk house was built. That's still in the village. Some of you may know where that is. It's now one of the many wine tasting um, places in the village. It was originally a post office. It was a stagecoach stop, an art gallery. It's been through um, many lives, um, but it is still there. Now the lodge, still owned by the Pacific Improvement Company, became a resort and it became an extension of the Del Monte Hotel. This is right down the road from me. So this is all for me to think about all of these people that were living in this area. Um, in the 1890s, uh, the Del Monte Hotel, when it was cold in Monterey, would have a, a, um, an outing for its guests and they'd come out in carriages and they'd come out to the Las Lorelas Lodge where it was warm and they could picnic and, and um, have, a, have a, a fun day and in some cases even spend the night. 
So that went on for about 30 years. And then Samuel F. B. Morse bought the Hotel Del Monte and bought the lodge and owned that this whole area. But it didn't last too long because they started to divide it up into different parcels. And oh, there was a golf champion who owned part of it. And um, Muriel Vanderbilt Phelps um, had an equestrian estate. Robles del Rio was, that's where a lot of the summer houses were and a beautiful part of the valley on the other side of the village um, was established. Uh, the village started to be a little village and Byington Ford came along and created an airport. There's this little, you know, you don't know about this, it's this tiny airport out in the middle of the village. That's the way it looked in the 1940s. And his hope was to make a subdivision out there where you'd fly in with your private plane, you'd have your hangar right there on the airport grounds, and then you'd have your house above it. Well, he was doing this in 1941. And as he was getting his marketing and publicity out, um, World Pearl Harbor came about. And so he didn't go anywhere with it. But the airport has been used over time. It's now actually owned by um, a nursery. And at this time, the village started to have a general store and a barber shop and a drug store. Um, and this was all for the ranchers and the people who had, um, were farming out in the area. But in 1951, things started to change. And I, I recommend that if you are researching your house, contact the local historical society. They will have information about your area. It's not your specific house, at least the general area. And if you're in a neighborhood association in Monterey, um, many of their newsletters um, touch on the history of their house. I also want to say that this is a very popular question at the Monterey, popular, Monterey Public Library in the California History Room. And we answer a lot of questions about people's homes. So uh, Sean's the one to contact on that. But in my case, out in Carmel Valley, there is a Carmel Valley Historical Society, and they do put out a newsletter. And one month in 2018, um, there was an article on the subdivision in where I live. And um, I did not know that it was established in 1951. It was the Rancho um, uh, Del Monte subdivision. And a country club was built. You can see here, uh, there is a clubhouse, a pool, there's tennis courts, there were guest rooms, and people would come out and stay at this, um, at this hotel. It began the construction, it was called the club, and Salinas and Carmo residents would come out, and there was a guest room, and there were a pool and restaurant, bar and lounge, shuffleboard, and that's right near where my home is. Tennis, horseshoes, it was quite the place to come, and of course it was warm. So that's in 1951. The picture on the lower right is what it looks like today. And I circled where that, that club is. There's now four to 5,000 homes throughout the hills there. But you can see there were no homes in 1950. And that blue line is Carmel Valley Road. So now let's get a little bit more specific about my house. Um, it is an organic house. It was built in the 1950s. And it's a house that isn't um, so, uh, 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 it doesn't have architectural excitement, but it's a house that responds to the environment rather than imposing itself on the environment. The important thing is what's outside and how the house draws it in. And in the case of, of the architect, Walter Bird, he studied the site and he created a design based on the site. Now, a beautiful example of this um, mid-century modern house is Frank Lloyd Wright's Walker House on Scenic, which I'm sure most of you have seen, was built in 1948. And you can see how he took the rocks of the Carmel Beach and then built the foundation to resemble the rocks he built on that land so that it ties in with the land. That's the, the gist of a mo mid-century modern um, house. The Monterey Public Library uh, was designed by William Wooster, who also did a lot of these houses. And if you look at the design of the Monterey Public Library, you will see that it incorporates the adobe style, but it also uses glass and steel, um, and it works with its site, the, the odd little corner that um, the library is built on. So one of the first things I recommend you do when you're looking for things about your house is get to know your neighbors. 
because your neighbors will remember what happened in the neighborhood before you moved in. So invite them over, or have something out on the patio so you're outside, and a glass of wine and find out what they knew about your house. So as we got to know our neighbors, we found out that Jim Ziegler, who was the man who built the house, had a blacksmith's forge on the property. And the lot next to us had this weird um, cement slab. And we realized that that was probably the blacksmith's forge. The neighbors told us that Margaret, his wife, was an artist who painted portraits and landscape. She had an art studio, which had, um, and this explains a room that has really amazing light. And then I met a lady who at 16 sat for a portrait painted by her in that studio. And the lady told, shared with me the experience that she had had. Jim Ziegler was a photographer and that explained an odd little room that was a dark room that we really didn't wonder what that was all about. Margaret taught piano, she had two pianos and the neighbors remembered her playing the piano on it when the windows were open, it was so lovely. Um, Ellsworth Gregory is a piano tuner, had tuned five of, I met him at a Connell Valley Historical Society meeting and he had tuned five of her pianos and he told me that two of them are what is now our dining room. So I think of her, her pianos being where our dining room is. And, and just these things made me rethink some of the things in the house. And the neighbors said they had two children, they had horses and a black and white cat. So one of those serendipitous things happened. Um, I was on the reference desk at the Monterey Public Library and I was finishing up a reference question. I went over, we have folders where we keep things for people to pick up the questions that we've answered. And on the counter next to where I was going to put my information was a copy of a newspaper article in the Monterey at that time Peninsula Herald. And it said thrice married Ziegler's and Ziegler is not a really common name, retired in Carmel Valley. I looked down and I thought, oh my goodness, these are my Ziegler's. Now, why was that? paper right there waiting for me to find. I don't know, but it was there. So from that newspaper, and by the way, um, those of you who do, do have Monterey homes and Peninsula homes, uh, the Monterey Library does have a, um, has indexed from 1846 to 1964, the Monterey Herald. So you can go in and look for your home or look for people who may have lived in your home online. Uh, you don't have to go into the library. You can actually do it on, online from the library site. So this was a 1965 article and this was a picture and I know exactly where that was taken. This was her art studio in this room that has amazing light and there's her husband photographer with his hooded camera taking a picture of her painting. The caption under this picture said Jim Ziegler of Carmel Valley prepares to photograph his wife Margaret putting the finishing touches to Madonna and Child on the wall of her studio is one of a series of valley landscapes for which she is equally noted. The Ziegler's world travelers for more than 25 years retired to the valley nine years ago and have been frequent prize winners for their art. So that article answered some questions for me. First, it told me the house was built in 1956. It told me the architect's name, Walter Bird. It explained Japanese features because the article mentioned that they had lived in Japan. He was with American Express before the war. And when the war broke out, he came back with his wife and family to uh, um, the United States. But there are a lot of Japanese features like a koi pond and, and a, a tokonoma, a, a little place where you would put a shrine of some kind. There are features that were very Japanese to us, but I didn't understand exactly where the, that had come from. It explained the room that had been a dark room and the room that had been an art studio. So then I started to go down the rabbit hole of Walter Bird. I wanted to find out about him. And I saw indeed that there is a, he had a, 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 an architectural company, Bird, Shaw and Associates, that he was a follower of Frank Lloyd Wright and William Wooster. And he did designs and he lived in Pacific Grove. And these are two of the places that you may know that he uh, designed. One is the uh, 7th and Dolores, it's now a restaurant, and the other is a gas station in Carmel. You may have read about in the Pinecone lately, there's been some question about a community hall that is behind this 7th and Dolores, formerly a bank, um, that the new owner wants to tear down and do some building, and there's some question about the historical significance because of the significance of Bird and Shaw, so that we will see what happens with that, um, but this building is not at risk. It's the community hall that's behind it. 
So the pine cone's been running a series on that. So then the Carmel Valley Historical Society, and it was thank you, thanks to Elizabeth Barrett, who is an historian with, with the um, society, an article came out on James, I couldn't believe it, James and Margaret Ziegler, and this picture of, of James, Jim with his um, camera. And then these two pictures, this blacksmith, and that is a gate by our house, it's changed, that pepper tree is still there. There is Margaret with her black and white cat. I really believe that our ancestors speak to us and that these things fall into our laps. It's like, I want you to know this story. And I think that this happened in some ways with um, when I was doing research on our house. Jim Ziegler was um, a, uh, he was very interested in photographing the ranches in Carmel Valley. And he has taken some uh, uh, iconic photos of the ranching life in the 1950s in Carmel Valley. His daughter had these photographs in her house. She lived on Fi in Pfeiffer area, the Pfeiffer fire. And she had just given them to um, the Carmel Valley uh, Historical Society. And then her house was burned in the Pfeiffer fire. So um, fortunately, the Historical Society has these and they had an exhibit of his photographs. And then a friend um, was at a garage sale and she picked up this picture. You'll notice M. Ziegler down in the right hand corner. And um, I was telling her the story of our house and she said, oh my goodness, I have a watercolor that Margaret did. And when she came into our house, and you can see the Japanese influence here. When she came into our, a friend came into our house, she said, that's the view in the picture, which it is the view of Garland uh, Ranch. So that was an amazing find, the picture that she probably sat at the window in our living room and painted this, this um, watercolor. Okay, so how do we find if, you know, I had a lot of things happen that were lucky, but there are ways you can go about looking for these things. One of them is directories. The Monterey Public Library has Monterey directories that go back to the turn of the century. Other public libraries, now I'm talking about Monterey, but other libraries have these directories and you can write to them if your house is in another part of the country. They're reverse directories. You look up the address and it tells you who lived in that house at that time. Notice this is 1984. James Ziegler was living in this house in 1984. So already I could have identified the name. Now the other way is you wanna to go to the Monterey County Recorder and Assessors and that's in Salinas. Many areas have digitized their deeds, digitized their records. It makes it so much easier for us. Monterey has not done that. You need to physically go there and you wanna check on the times now with COVID, how the things are changing. But I did, I went to the Monterey County Recorder and I followed the change of title on my property. I'm gonna walk you through this. You start with yourself because you're the grantee and you identify who sold it to you, the grantor. And you keep following each sale back, grantee, grantor, grantee, grantor. I started with us and I went back to James Ziegler. There were two owners between us and I was able to document each sale of the house. The Monterey County Recorder website will give you the name of the grantee, the grantor, the date of sale, the document number, the book and page, the numbers of pages of each deed and each sale. And then you go to the recorder office with this information and they will give you a copy of that deed. You can also uh, obtain survey maps. Okay, so this was a survey map that I obtained from the, um, from the recorder's office. And this is how you do it. You go into their website and you see the online document access. You click on it. You have to do a disclaimer because they don't wanna take responsibility for anything that you find. So you accept that. You go into the official record search. Now this would be for the more recent, this is not for the Prunedale Ranch, this is for the more recent um, 50, 60 year old um, properties. And I can search by name, I search by Nielsen, our names, and they showed me the name of the, um, the, grand, the grand tour who we bought the property from. When you're doing this, it's a good idea to keep a track of it because you want to keep track of the document number and the page. So when you go up to the counter and request a copy, you've got it all there. And if you're going 
grantee, grantor, grantee, you know, you can get confused. So I, I really recommend you keep track of it all. So you get, the, you get the survey map, you get the deeds. Now you wanna to go to the assessor. Now the assessor, you can only get information if you own the property. And you have to prove through your uh, personal ID that you are the owner. But the great things that you can get when you go to the assessor is you get a building record, you get drawings of your, of your house, you get any additions that were made, any remodels. That is if you used a permit. If you didn't use a permit, they won't be there. Um, and remember, the assessors are the ones who are the tax charges for our property taxes. So you go into the Monterey County Assessor Parcel Quest page, and you put in your assessor's PIN number, and it will take you right to um, um, what you need to do. And you can request some of these things online, but it's really much more efficient to go into the assessor's office and request it. Okay, so what I got when I went to the assessor's office I got the fact the studio was added in 1964. Remember, the house was built in 1956. A shop was enclosed and a room and closet were added in 1991. It's a map of all this. The garage was added in 1991 and there was a kitchen remodel. So this was really the history of this house, which was, was quite interesting to me. So when all is said and done, um, I was able to put together a little bit about the life of the people who lived in our house. And the thing that I think that is amazing, this house did call to us. When I found out that an artist, a musician, and a photographer built this house and left their spirit in the house and were there for 30 years, the other people were only there for a few years. We've been in the house nearly 30 years as well. My, father, my husband is a very fine photographer. My son is a musician, a rock musician and rock music flowed out over the valley from our garage when he was living at home. And my daughter is a beautiful artist. It's like the spirit of this house was carried forth in my family and that we were carried, meant to carry on a little bit of the tradition of the original builders. So that's the story of my house. And I hope that you will try and use some of these sources to find the story of your house. Don't limit yourself just to the building, Limit, you know, go beyond and see what the history of the area is of your house. Okay, now the Prunedale Ranch. This is the 90 year house. I was interested in this. Remember again, I've said, those of you that have been with me for the last couple of months, um, we know pretty much the stories of three generations. We know our stories, we know our parents' stories, and very likely we know some of our grandparents' stories, but by the time it gets to great grandparents, we really don't know their stories. And I've heard things about my great grandparents, but I have a lot of questions and I wish I had asked my mother more, my mother, <laughs> but you know, we don't do that. We don't think about it. So when I was researching the Prunedale Ranch, I wanted to find out about what their daily life was like. I wanted to know what it was like to live in Prunedale at the turn of the century. This is my great grandmother, Helen Georgina Collins, and this is the ranch house um, in Primdale. It's right off highway, it was, it is, parts of it are still, it's not nowhere near the same. So to put together the story of the Collins family, I went to records, I went to the census, I went to voter registration, directories, I went to maps, I went to deeds and wills and newspapers, photos and local history. And I started to put their story together with the story of things I had heard about over time from my mother. And then I put together a timetable, just like I timeline, just like I did with my own house. I knew that in 1874, Helen married George Kemsley in Michigan. And in 1891, they were divorced. In 1891, Helen and her four children, one of them my grandmother, made the trip west on the train. And in 1891 of that year, she married again. In 1892, they purchased the Prunedale property. And in, it's right on Highway 1. It, it crossed Highway, 1, Highway 101. Uh, in 1931, Highway 101 was constructed and impacted their property. My great-grandfather, my step-great-grandfather, this is the second, her second marriage, died in 1931. Helen died in 1941. My grandmother, who inherited that property, died in 1967. 
From 1960 to 1980, there was an accident on Highway 101. I'll go into that a little bit, which changed the uh, changed the the this which brought about the sale of the property, and that was in 1982. In 1986, division of property into two lots. Now, my brother was um, <clears throat> cleaning out some of the things in his attic, and he brought over some boxes of photos. And in that box, which I just discovered this weekend, it was like my diary falling out of the roof of that house, that house in San Francisco, was a ledger book with pictures of the Prunedale property. I couldn't believe it. There were pictures put together by my grandmother. My grandmother went to the Chestnut Wood Business School in Santa Cruz in 1897, she graduated. This is her graduation picture. And um, she was a friend of Julia Pfeiffer, so she became a friend who was a friend of hers for all her life. She took an old register or ledger book that she must have been using with her school, her secretarial school, and she pasted pictures of the ranch in this. So I'm gonna share with you some of these pictures. This was an amazing find. Um, this is a picture of the first husband, George Kimsley. He was a, um, an engineer on the Great Lakes. And this is probably their wedding picture. Um, he may have been way home away a lot. She was raising four children. Um, but I did find in the newspaper in uh, 1891, uh, there are not as many divorce cases as usual. There being only four docketed for the coming year. Following are the titles of these four, Helen G. Kemsley versus George Kemsley. And that was in June of, 19, of 1891. I tried to get the papers of that. I, I was not able to, I'm not giving up yet. I'd love to know more of the details, but I don't know the details. So she divorced her husband and she packed up her four kids. Uh, this is Kenneth, Walter, Ray, and my grandmother in the middle, Catherine. And she got on a train, right? The divorce proceedings were in August. She's on a train that fall. And she's met at the train um, by George, by John Collins, 1891. He was from Michigan. She did know him in Michigan. So this is amazing. Uh, they were married 50 years. This is an amazing woman who left a husband. I don't know any of the details. Packed up her kids and came out and met, hopefully, the love of her life. Here's their marriage certificate. So I know that they were married on December 15th, 1981. Again, the divorce proceedings were August, 1891. So I wanted to learn more about this property. And I went back to the recorder's office. And you can see John Collins purchased this property from the Tuttle family, Hiram Tuttle. This picture is taken. For this, you have to go into and use their computers and their records for the older deeds. But I could find the page in the deed, and I went up to the counter, and I requested uh, the deed. Again, I needed a research log because it was getting really confusing, and I wanted to keep track of all the transfer of property. So I found out through the deed that it was purchased from Hiram Tuttle and his wife, Rebecca, in 1892. Now, they were married in 1891. The Tuttles had nine children, and I found that out through the census. In the photo album was a picture of the Tuttle children the family from which the land was purchased. And again, another rabbit hole I went down. I wanted to find out more about Hiram. And I saw he was a Civil War veteran. He was a teamster and a pollster. And sadly, he died three years after he sold 50 acres of uh, his property. My step-great-grandfather purchased that land for $3,000 in gold coins. That's about $88,000 a day. And I would love to know how he had so much money. He must have just really been saving it, or I, I don't know, but he purchased it for $3,000 in gold coins. The Tuttles had 138 acres, and they sold 50 acres to the Collinses. And the Tuttles, even though Hiram passed away, his wife and children remained neighbors, and their pictures are in this ledger. Oh, there's a picture of the ranch. Highway 101 is in the front. Behind the house would be the Prunedale Road. It's an apple orchard. It was part of the Rancho Balsa Nueva y Moro Coho. Again, that rancho was listed in the deed, and that rancho was part of a Mexican land grant given to Maria Antonio Pico de Castro. And that land grant went from Moss Landing to Prudenville and south to Castroville, so generally in this area. Again, um, that will be in your deeds if it was part of a Mexican land grant. And that's, that's very interesting because then, of course, you want to research more about what life was like 
under that, uh, that rancho. Here's the deed. Here's what it says um, at the bottom. Beginning at a stake in the fence at the southwest corner of Jess Toby's house, this is meets and bounds, remember, it's not the surveying court, uh, rectangular shapes. And on the east side of the county road from Salina City to Watson through, through San Miguel Canyon, it's up there by that shopping, San Miguel Canyon shopping center. Then Salon Toby's south line and being a part of lot seven in section D of the Bosa Nueva y Moro Coho Rancho. So each bill of sale talks about this Mexican rancho. Here again is the land. And here are some pictures that were in this, that ledger. Um, this is my great grandparents with their, some of their grandkids. This was their horse identified as Maggie in the book and uh, uh, the dog, I believe it was Sandy. And in this picture on the right, my great grandfather has a parrot on his right arm. The parrot's name was Billy. I didn't know that, but Billy appears in several pictures. So that's my uh, great uh, grandparents. And here he is with his horses. Now, this is a folk house. Their house has very common rural areas, very common farmhouse. It's a gable in the front and it's got a wing. And you can see there's a shed roof that makes an L shape with the gable of that uh, side on the left. There are small windows in the attic. And with the development of the railroads, lumber could be brought in. They didn't have to you know, cut down trees. Uh, and two by fours, which caused the balloon framing, those are those boards on the side on the corners, made the house pretty easy to establish. I believe they built this house because if the, the Tuttles lived on and they stayed in the other part of the acre, they were in the original house. So the Collins built, uh, on their 50 acres, and I believe that, that this is the house that they built. I don't, I can't prove it. The Monterey County Place Names um, is a book in, in our library um, by Donald Clark, and I looked up Prunedale, and I wanted to see what was happening when they were living there. 1893, Carl Bates' grandfather came to Prunedale in 1893, and this place was orchard at the time. There was no prominent person to name it after, or any prominent features, so they called it Prunedale. And then the Casterville Enterprise in 1894 wrote, at what is now known as Langley's Quarter in the San Miguel Canyon near here, an acre of land has been laid off in town lots for the purpose of starting a town to be known as Prunedale. It was spelled that way. A post office was established and Mr. Langley was a postmaster. A blacksmith from Natividad will soon open up a blacksmith shop and it expected that a physician will open a drugstore and practice medicine. The people also have assurance that a general merchandise store will be opened, and it is said that newspapers and real estate office will be established in the near future. San Miguel has a class of enterprising and progressive people who we have no doubt will liberally support all of the above mentioned enterprises. It is said that the people will make a strong effort to prevent the opening of a saloon in the town. And I don't know if they were able to do that or not, but that would have been when my family was there. Now, I wanted to find the address because I wanted to locate the ranch house on Prunedale Road. So I looked first at my great grandmother's death certificate and the address there was 171 Prunedale, but that address is not the same address. So that was not helpful, but it, certainly the death certificate has information. Um, it, the informant was an uncle, Ray, a brother of my grandmother's, and it does give his address in Tacoma. So that was interesting information. Uh, you may remember I talked about collateral family members, the siblings, and how they can give us information. So then I decided to go to the census. I wanted to find that address. Addresses are usually here on the side, no address. This is a rural community. It says it's Castorville. But I did find the Collins and the Tuttles on the census because they are neighbors. So the census taker went to the Tuttles and then went to the, the Collins. And I just want to remind you for sure, go to the next page because here's the Collins kids, Walter and Kenneth, who are still living at home. If I just looked at that first page, I would not have seen that two members of the children are still at home. I also started to look at names here, Richards, Blakey, uh, Passante, these are the neighbors that the census was taken. These people have pictures in this ledger. So your friends, associates, and neighbors appear 
in the census and they can give you more information about your family. 1910, still no address, but I've still got the Collinses. They're living alone now. The Blakeys are there, live down the road, and the Passantes live down the road. 1930, I finally got an address. It says Prunedale Salinas Road. Doesn't give me a specific thing. The Walkers appear. The Tuttles are still there. The Rouses are there. The Olsons. I was having my hair cut, and I was sharing this story with my um, lady cutting my hair, and she says, you know, I live across the street from where your great grandparents lived. She's an Olson. So that was amazing. Talk up your family, talk it with people. It's people who may have more information. Uh, so I still don't really have an address. 1930, I do know that they own the farm. Um, yes, they owned it. And yes, they have a radio. And I do see now it's San Miguel Canyon. So I know it's the San Miguel Canyon area, but not an address. These are some pictures that were in that ledger of um, neighbors that um, I wouldn't know who they were, except I was looking at the census and I saw these names of people reoccurring. This Lakey family, my family married into. The Lyons family, my family married into. They were neighbors down the road. This is uh, the Hiram Tuttle uh, son who came back from World War II. And they had his picture when he came back. So here's a satellite picture of, here's Highway 101. The ranch is right, was right in here, 50 acres. These neighbors are all along the Prunedale Road and into, it says Blackie, and you may have heard it as Blackie. My mother said the family was Blakey. It's hard for me to say Blackie. The family was Blakey. They just spelled it like Blackie. But in any case, these people all lived along this road. These were all their neighbors. And I know that from the census. So be sure and look at who your family lived next to. So then I thought, I still don't have the address. I'm gonna to go to voter registration. So I went to the Car Monterey um, Historical Society and they have not online, but they have voter registration. Here's John Collins, he's 48. Interesting, he's five foot seven, index finger of right hand stiff, a way of identifying him when he votes. He's from New York, he's living in Prindale. No address, 1904, also from the uh, Historical Society. He's gained an inch, he's 5'8 here, he's still Prindale, no address. So then I went to the directories. This directory was, these are the directories in the Monterey, um, in the California History Room. And I saw that they had a telephone, probably a party line, but no address. This is 1906. I went to the photographs in the Monterey County Free Libraries. They have a wonderful digital collection of, of local sites. And I found a picture of the old schoolhouse in Prunedale. This is very likely a schoolhouse where my, my grandmother and her brothers went to school. So that was fun to find that picture. I do have from the family uh, of a slate that my grandmother used at that schoolhouse. And I do also have um, a clock that was in the ranch style house, but I understand, my mother always used to say that my great grandfather bought two clocks, one for the old schoolhouse and one for the ranch house. So the Collins family raised apples. This is their apple orchard. And this was the road in 1897. This is part of their land. 2005, I went back to look at it and the road was still kind of not really, uh, you know, not really that changed in parts of it. There's a lot of houses on it now. Um, but as far as roads being changed, this is Highway 101. And this would have been taken about 1890s, 1900. This is where near the rocks on Highway 101. And this is my grandmother um, with her horse and buggy. But sadly, the property crossed 101. And in 1931, Highway construction began on Highway 101. And the Collins family was forced or chose to, I, you know, I don't know if it's eminent domain or what happened, the right of way. And they had to sell two and a half acres to the state of California, which divided their 50 acres in half. They sold that on March 6th. I found that in the recorder's office. They received $2,000, probably about $30,000 today. And that deed of sale was in the recorder's office. So I saw at one point they had to sell that. And eventually they sold that property on the other side because it wasn't 
it was really hard to get to. And sadly, it was sold in March. John Collins died in June of 1931. So he probably didn't have the energy to fight it or, or do anything with it. He passed away several, just a couple of months later. I found in the ledger pictures of the blasting of the highway uh, in 1931. And after, underneath these pictures are, is after the blast. So this is the road, Highway 101. It was only two lanes at first and later became four lanes that went through their property. Here on the lower left, lower right is the getting into the rocks area. So that was in 1931. So my great grandmother lived in the house in 1940. I, she died in 1941. I was concerned about her living in that old farmhouse by herself. But when I looked at the census, I was really relieved to see that my aunt and her first husband were living with her. And I was also relieved to see that my grandmother and my grandfather had come down, they were living in Tacoma, to be with her. So she wasn't alone. She had her granddaughter and her husband, and at some time she had her daughter and his, her son-in-law. Um, my uh, grandmother and her family would come down on a regular basis during the summer to visit and stay with her mother and stepfather. And this is them coming down in the model. Uh, and Model A um, to see the ranch. So Helen passed away in December 1941, and the property was inherited by my grandmother and my great uncle. My aunt, Helen Lyons, my aunt now married into a dairy family uh, down the road, the Lyons family. She managed the rent as a rental property, and um, she lived on Blakey Road. My brother and I would come down um, uh, uh, to see visit my aunt and uncle on the dairy farm, which was right down the road from the Prundell house. And um, we'd come down on the Del Monte Express. Maybe some of you remember that. It came into Monterey, it was uh, eliminated in 1971, but my parents would put us on the train. We were maybe 10, 12, under the care of the conductor in San Francisco, and my aunt and uncle would meet us in Castroville at the train station. We'd come down for a week, two weeks. We lived in the Bay Area. And on one of those trips between renters in this old farmhouse, I was just exploring, and I found in the attic a book called Bright Jewels, Grand Union Tea Company, quote, our teas being pure are especially qualified for children juice, dated 1889. I guess it was already be a beginning budding genealogist then because I said to my aunt, can I, can I keep this? Is this a book I can keep? It probably was my, gra my grandmother's. And my aunt said, absolutely. I still have that book. Uh, so that was something that was up in the attic and, and very likely a book that belonged to the kids. My grandmother died in 1967 and the property then went to my aunt, my uncle and cousins, uh, the other, other grandchildren. And they continued to rent out the property until there was an accident on Highway 1. Remember, this property was right on Highway 101, and there was a fence right there. The horse of one of the renters got out and caused an accident. My parents were, of course, very concerned about the liability and very sad about what happened. So shortly after that, the property was sold after being in the family for 90 years. And I think that was a very hard thing for my mother and my aunt to do and for the, their cousin, because it had been so much a part of their lives. But when I found that bill of sale, I finally found the address, 9575 Prunedale Road South. I went and looked it up, and I saw that the property was divided in 1986 into two parcels. I got, I went to the recorder's office, I got a parcel map, and here are the two parcels. Here's Highway 101, you see how close it is. Here's the Prunedale Road right there. They had sold everything on the other side of, of Highway 101. Here's is a map I got from the assessor's office. And here's the two parcels. This is a vineyard, Olson Wineries, which maybe you've had the pleasure of trying some of their wine. Um, but here's where the land is and here's Highway 101. This is the way the house looked in 2005. I went back to see it shortly after my mother died with a cousin. You can see that this is the other side facing the other side of this house. 
um, where my great grandmother is standing. This is what it looked like in 2005. It's changed now. There's a fence around it. They've made additions. It isn't. It's lost its integrity, really. I was glad I got this 2005 picture, which does show a little bit of the house. Across the street is a neighbor's house, still intact. Uh, again, a folk house, that time period. Okay, so here's the resources I used. I used architectural references, Zillow. Go to Zillow and see if your house is on Zillow because it will tell you the square feet and the year it was built and maybe some additions and of course Google Maps. If your house, if you're lucky enough to have a historic house, be sure and check out the historic surveys. Maps, we didn't talk about Sanborn and Platt maps. Maybe we'll talk about that at another time, but those are really helpful. But I use the survey maps for these two pieces of property. I use the census. I use the local newspapers, put in the street or address in, um, in as you search in newspapers. I use directories. I use the voter registration. The wills, the Monterey wills are at the Aquahito Courthouse. I went to, to Salinas, the Monterey County Recorder and Assessor's Office. And I used my local historical society here in Carmel Valley. And I used the California History Room. And I've used the Monterey um, Historical Society up in, in uh, Salinas. And I definitely use the neighbors. I want to recommend um, this to you. Um, Sean sent you a link to this. This is a, a document that one of our volunteers put together. It's about 20 pages. It's how to trace the history of your Monterey house. You can use all of these tips to trace the history of any house anywhere. So I recommend that you download this and look at it for some more ideas if you are interested in pursuing uh, the history of your home. Uh, you can find that on the Monterey Library site under the History Room. Lots of good sources in the California History Room webpage for genealogists, so take a look at that. So facts get recorded, stories get remembered. So what's your story? But I would take that a step further. Facts get recorded, stories get remembered. So what's the story of your home? Because the story of your home is the story of you, and the story of the home of your ancestors is their story. So get busy and find those stories because every home does indeed have a story. So that's um, about homes. But next month, we're going to talk about what are you going to do with all of your family stuff, your heirlooms and any research you've done. What are we going to do with it? Our kids aren't going to want all the stuff we have. So how can we make it get it out there to people who might be interested and preserve some of it for our families. That's gonna be October 14th. And then we're gonna jump ahead because the November date landed on Veterans Day and the library's closed. We're gonna jump ahead to November 9th and we're gonna talk about how you share your family stories. we we'll talk about that, but we're just gonna jump in and we're gonna do it. So that's what's coming up on All Things Relative in October and December. So Chan, Sean, if you want to get in touch with him at the Monterey Public Library and California History Room, he will be happy to help you do research on your family's home. And if you'd like to have any questions for me, please email me and I'll be happy to get back to you. So thank you. So I'm going to stop sharing. And um, if there are any questions, um, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you so much, Kathy, for that wonderful presentation. And at this time, um, we will open it up for questions. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself or you can type it into the chat. Looks like we have some questions coming in. Uh, first question, Kathy, any suggestions on researching Pebble Beach homes other than the county? Yes, um, I definitely go to the Pacific Grove Library uh, because they do have a local history section. And I'd also check out Carmel because uh, Carmel has uh, uh, another section is the local history um, department of the Carmel Library. Um, so I think I, I would start there with those two and I would look at the pine cone and I'd look at the Pacific Grove uh, local paper and the library can help you with that. But Monterey and you, we have Pebble doesn't, Monterey Public Library has Pebble Beach things too. So come see Sean, he might be able to find something as well. Yes, we get lots of uh, home research questions at the California History Room. So if you are looking to research your home, please stop on by. I'd be happy to help. 
Uh, another question, where, where can one find marriage licenses? Oh, marriage licenses are in the courthouses as well. Um, but many are digitized on subscription sites. So I would definitely check out familysearch.org and I check out Ancestry if you, if you have um, a subscription. But remember, Ancestry is free also still at the Monterey Public Library. Um, so I would check there first and then you can also get it from the courthouse. Thank you. Um, where, where is the recorder's office? It's... Um, I, I, I can't remember the name, maybe someone can help me, the name of the street, but it is where we go when we have jury duty. It's where the, the Alice, courthouse Alice, is. Alice okay. House Street. Alice House, thank you. Um, okay, so we're getting some questions coming in. Are there any COVID restrictions, oh, to visiting the California History Room at the Monterey Public Library? Uh, yes, we do require that everyone wear a mask um, all the time within the library and the California History Room. Is it good to make an appointment also, Sean? Yes, um, if, you're, if you would like to do some, if you need help starting your research, um, kind of figuring out what resources are available, I definitely would recommend making an appointment with me. This way I can set some time out to focus on what you're looking for. But if you are, if you do kind of know what you're looking for, which resources you'd like to look at, um, as long as they're not in our archives, you're more than welcome to come in the California History Room is open uh, when the library is open. So that's Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 6. Question for you, Kathy. Since much of Carmel has no street numbers, how do they reference the homes? Since as each house is added, it would change the count for the corner reference. That's a really good question. And I, you know, I think that the local history librarian in Carmel can really help with that. I, I can't answer that question. Um, Katie, what is her name? Uh, Katie. Any, anyway, you want to yeah. just go on the Carmel uh, website and make an appointment with her. Yes, Katie at the Carmel Public Library is, is excellent. She definitely knows how to navigate the the different houses in Carmel. So I would definitely reach out to her too. And the Sanborn might, maps might be really helpful with that. And she probably, she will have um, access to that. All right. Um, if there's no more questions from the group, um, then I think that's it for today. Um, Thank you so much, Kathy, for taking your time and spending it with us. Um, we hopefully will see you guys all next month um, at the next um, All Things Relative uh, program. Thank you. It's great to see you again. I look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you so much, Kathy. Have a great evening, everybody.